Well, hello to all you folks here today, and of course, you folks on the CD program as well. It has been mentioned recently, I believe by Mr. Smith back there, if I'm not mistaken, that the book of, a, of Ezekiel <coughs> is a book of end time prophecy, mostly for the house of Israel. That is the house of Israel today. And that, that's true. For the time of Ezekiel's writing, Israel was in captivity by the Chaldeans. And as you read the book of Ezekiel, it's obvious what he is prophesying, what he is speaking of, is for a future time in the history of Israel, not at his present time. For us today, the end time. In Ezekiel 1, 1 through 3, we read, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Shebar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehonakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, I guess that is, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Shebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And then let's go to chapter 2. And read 1 through 4 here. It says, And he, that is, came to me, speaking of Christ, for the Lord. Ezekiel says, And he came to me and said, Son of man, stand upon your feet, and I will speak unto you. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, and I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed, transgressed against me even unto this very day. And that includes God's nation of Israel and his people as I stand here. For they are an impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send you unto them. Thus says the Lord God. So we see that what Ezekiel has to say is sent to the house of Israel. Verse 5 here. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear or won't hear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know that there has been a prophet among them. And on over in chapter 3, on down in chapter 3 here, verse 4, Ezekiel says, And he said unto me, Son of man, go get you unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. And on down to verse 17, the Lord tells Ezekiel, says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. So the book of Ezekiel is a warning to the house of Israel. Verse 18 19 here it says when I say unto the wicked you shall surely die and you give them not warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will I require of your hand 
Yet, if you warn the wicked, <clears throat> and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Now, that's what Mr. Trent, Mr. Smith, myself, Brian, Bobby, Blaine, that's what we try to do. <clears throat> For if we don't, and someone dies in their sins who might have otherwise heard the truth of God by us and were drawn closer to God by something we might have said, then their blood is upon our heads. But if they hear the truth and don't heed the truth of what we say and what we preach, <clears throat> then their blood is upon their own head. So again, we are held again accountable by God to preach the truth, regardless. We don't intentionally try to insult people, except maybe Bobby. Just kidding. <laughs> we don't try to intentionally insult people. <clears throat> However, we have to teach the truth of the Bible. God requires that of us. And if that truth offends you, or somehow you are insulted by the truth, don't come to us. Take it up with God if the truth offends you. And I say this, because while, while comparing what the Lord says by the mouth of Ezekiel to some of the things going on today may offend someone as I go through this. And I want everybody to know, to know I'm not intentionally trying to offend anyone. However it would seem in this country, the great majority of people and a lot who are in God's church, it would seem, came out of the womb either a Republican or a Democrat. That's how they entered this world. Now, I love this country, and I readily admit, I hope we don't get more of the same in our next presidential election as we have now. But if the other party doesn't try to do something about what this administration has done, are they any better? They have to do something, or it's the same old thing. In chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Ezekiel, and we certainly don't have time to read all that, but here we see God passing judgment on Israel for, that, for their idolatrous, I <coughs> can't speak, and wicked ways. Chapter 5, we will go to chapter 5. Let's go on over to chapter 5, starting in verse 8. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against you, and will execute judgments in the midst of you, in the sight of the nations. And I will do in you that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like. So it's going to be something that's never been done before because of your abominations. And then verse 11. Wherefore, as I live, says the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things, and with all your abominations, therefore will I also diminish you, or leave you, is what he's saying, I'm going to leave you. Neither shall my eyes spare, neither will I have pity. Can you think of anything we have done as a nation lately? which would be classified as an abomination before God? I think we all know what the Supreme Court ruling that just came down on same-sex marriage is, that it's legal 
in all 50 states. I think we all know that. Leviticus 18:22 through 24 says, You shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. And God says he's going to punish us for our abominations. Neither shall you lie with any beast to defile yourself therewith. Neither shall woman stand before a beast to lie down therein too. It is confusion. Defile not yourselves in any of these things. For in all these things the nations were defiled which I cast out before you. And in Leviticus 20, 13, it says, If a man lie with mankind, as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. 2015, if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. Verse 16, if a woman approach unto any beast to lay down there unto, you shall kill the woman and the beast, and their blood shall be upon their head. Do you see any homosexuals, lesbians, or people who practice bestiality put to death for their abominations today? No, it's legal. It's legal according to the highest courts of the land and with the sanctions of the highest leader in the land. They don't have to worry about dying for their detestable practices. It's legal. Where have we come as a nation? Verse 15 here in Ezekiel 5. So it shall be a repro reproach and a taunt, an instruction, and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about you. When I execute judgments on you in anger and in fury, or in furious rebukes, I am the Lord that hath spoken it. Let's go to chapter 7 now, starting in verse 8. Now, what I sh now will I shortly pour out my fury upon you and accomplish my anger upon you, and I will judge you according to your ways. God is going to judge this nation. He has already judged it. And will recompense you for all your abominations. My eye shall not spare, neither shall I have pity. Verse 9. I will recompense you according to your ways and your abominations that are in the midst of you. And you shall know that I am the Lord that smites. I'm sorry, folks. I wish I could do something about it. But God is telling us what's coming. But I can't. And it's coming because of our abominations. But how did, how, did all, <clears throat> how did all this creep in, and who is responsible for it? There's some interesting scripture over in chapter 13 of Ezekiel, if you want to turn over there. Which seems to shed some light on this if you meditate on what it's saying. Ezekiel 13. Starting in 1 and 2. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Again, son of man, prophesy or preach against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say you unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear you the word of the Lord. So you've got these false preachers, and the Lord's telling Ezekiel to prophesy or preach against them. He says they're preaching, they're not preaching what the Scripture says, but they're preaching what they want it to say. Saying, thus says the Lord, and God says, that's not what I said at all. They're prophesying or preaching out of their own hearts. 
verse 3. Thus says the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, your prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. You have not gone up, you have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divinations, saying, The Lord said, and the Lord has not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. So all these so-called religious leaders out there in the religious community, they haven't built up this wall of truth around the people. Rather, they have built up a wall which has no moral clarity. They haven't even closed in the gaps or the breaches, the holes in the wall, if you will. And these gaps or holes in the wall, folks, is the immorality in our nation today. But very few preachers out there in the religious community preach against homosexuality, homosexuality and abortion and other such atrocities. They just don't do it. As a matter of fact, some churches have homosexuals in the clergy. You've got homosexuals getting up and preaching what they want the Bible to say. And they've convinced their congregations that what they're saying is the truth. But that's what people wants to hear. So these false preachers preach what the people want to hear for the money. Verse 7. Have you not seen a vain vision? And have you not spoken a lying divination? Speaking of these false speaking of these false prophets. Whereas you say the Lord said it, however, God says, I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, says the Lord God. And my hand shall be upon the prophets, or the preachers out there, that see vanity and that divine lies, or teach lies. And they shall not be in the assembly of my people. They won't be in the first fruits of God's people, nor may never be in God's assembly. I don't know. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Won't be in the book of life, seems to say. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, seeming to say they won't be in enter into eternal life. Of course, that's my take on that. And you shall know that I am the Lord God. And then in verse 10, it says, Because, even because they have seduced my people, speaking of the religious community out here, saying, Peace, and there is no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others dabbed it with untempered mortar. Let me first explain what untempered mortar is. Now, I don't know if any of you ever laid any block or stonework, uh, but when you're laying a block wall or stone wall, you have to use mortar to bind those blocks or stone together. You can't just use sand and water alone. You have to add cement to the mixture, which is the binder or the temper. So when it dries, it sticks everything together. Without the cement in the mix, the wall is just sitting there, and the least little disruption will tear it down. So, <clears throat> here you've got the Catholic Church who's built up this great so-called religious wall. And indeed, 
they have seduced the people. And they do preach peace. But when you look around it, you see that there is no peace. That is, you know, preaching peace is one of their more outgoing messages. But we can plainly see that there is no peace. Then you have her daughters, the Protestant community, coming along and dabbing this wall with untempered mortar, dabbing the joints in this wall with vanity and lies, preaching things which are not the truth of God, and upholding things which God plainly says are abominations. <clears throat> Verse 11, say unto them which dab it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and you, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the dabbing wherewith you have dabbed it? God says, verse 14, I will break down the wall that you have dabbed with untempered mortar. These lies and vanity that we hear preached today. And bring it down to the ground so that, so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall fall and you shall cause it, and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof and you shall know that I am the Lord God. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have dabbed it with untempered mortar. And will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that dabbed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace <coughs> for her, when there is no peace, says the Lord. You know, <coughs> as we read this, we see God is eventually going to destroy all these false religions right down to the foundation. And over in chapter 19 of Revelations, <coughs> we can see he is finally going to destroy the foundation as well. The great whore, the Babylonian system, the mother of all whores, of all false religions, which is the religions of Satan. Now let's go to Ezekiel 22 and take a look at how this corrupt religious system bleeds over into the corrupt civil system which we live under. <coughs> Chapter 22, starting in verse five, or 25. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, There is a conspiracy of her prophets or the religious community out here. She says, There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion, raving the prey, and they have devoured souls, and they have taken the treasure and precious things, and they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. God says these preachers are like roaring lions, devouring the prey, just ripping and shredding people to pieces. And you can turn on your TV set every Sunday morning. <clears throat> You've got all these Protestant preachers asking for money, and they don't care where it comes from. They take money from anyone that they can convince to send it to them. They prey upon the poor. And their message is, if you'll send me such and such amount of money, then God will give you back twice or three times that amount. That's their line. And a lot of gullible people, desperate for money, poor people, will fall for this scheme. So these people are like roaring lions, tearing from whomever they can. Verse 27. Let me see here. Chapter 2. Yeah, 27. It says, Her princes 
or our civil, civil leaders. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves raving to the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. The Lord begins to bring the political leaders into the mix here and shows us how all this blends together. In verse 27 there, we see that I just read, we see that the political leaders are no better than the religious leaders. For they too are only out to destroy souls for dishonest gain. And they don't see anything wrong, wrong with what they're doing. But why? The next verse tells us, verse 28, and said, her prophets or the religious community have dabbed them, that is the civil leaders, with untempered mortar, sin vanity and divining unto them lies. Saying, thus says the Lord when the Lord has not spoken. We've got the religious community lying to the civil leaders along with everyone else about what this book says. They will not teach the truth of what's in here. So our political leaders and almost everyone is going down the wrong road. They've all been taught lies about what's in the book. <clears throat> Verse 29. It says, The people of the land, speaking of the civil leaders again and the religious leaders, have used oppression. My margin says deceit, oppression and deceit, and have exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy, and they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Then verse 30. Pay attention to what it says here in verse 30. God says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge or the wall and stand in the gap the holes in the wall before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none, he said. Didn't find anybody. Couldn't find anybody. Now, we read this, and we might say to ourselves, well, we try to proclaim the truth. We try to live right. How come we can't build up the, uh, the wall and repair the holes? The answer is simple. We're too small. If all the churches of our tradition were to get back together, which they're not about to do, <coughs> because everybody wants to be the boss, <laughs> there would not be enough of us to do it. <coughs> we are a very small minority compared to the rest of the religious community out there. And it takes more than that, folks. It takes all the religious community teaching the truth of what's in this book, not just us. And it takes all our civil leaders working together to repair the damage that has been done. And that, my friends, ain't about to happen. We have gone too far down the sewer for that to ever happen. Verse 31, Therefore God says, I will pour out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, says the Lord. It's a sad situation, but that's what's coming. <clears throat> In a little over one year from now, our nation is going to have a presidential election. So far, there are four or five Democrats and 16 Republicans, <laughs> if I counted right. There may be more than that now. They're all seeking that position. And all, I would suspect, are praying to God to help them get into that office. Are any of these people capable of building up the wall and standing in the gap? 
Well, God has already given us the answer to that. But why are they not capable? Let's take a look. Hillary Clinton. <clears throat> Hillary Clinton <clears throat> is a Methodist. She says she prays regular and studies the Bible. In an interview with the New York Times, she described her faith as being like background music. It's always there. It's a faith center, she says, from which everything else flows. But she supports abortion, which has given the mother the right to legally murder her own child. But she's a good Christian. <clears throat> she's a Christian, she says, and I'll be using, and by the way, I'll be using the word Christian <laughs> loosely here, so as I go along. She's a Christian, but she believes in murder. <clears throat> Before 2013, she publicly opposed gay marriage, although she was in favor of same-sex civil unions. Same-sex couples should marry, according to her, but it's okay to shack up. But she has since changed her mind and said, <clears throat> said they should be given that constitutional right. She is also quoted as saying, one of her big problems is that many people believe they have a direct line to God and they never want to change their minds. Simply put, she's saying too many people believe in what God says and they never want to change their minds about what God says. In other words, you should be able to change your mind about what God says whenever it suits your purpose and for your own self-convenience. And that is exactly what she does. Can someone who thinks like this build up this wall of moral clarity? Ask yourself. Bernie Sanders, Democrat. Jewish by birth, but says he is not involved in any organized re religion as of now. However, he has expressed a deep admiration for Pope Francis and says he finds himself very close to his teachings, according to USA Today. Here you have a man who's closer to the teachings of his mortal enemy, he's a Jew, than to those of his own people. What about him? Is he qualified to stand in the gap? Martin O'Malley, Democrat, Catholic taught in a Catholic elementary school, in a Jesuit high school, and attended a Catholic university. <clears throat> now, I don't have time to get into all of what a Jesuit is and what their mission is. That's something I intend to address in a sermon all its own. But I will tell you this. The Jesuits are a military religious order of the Roman Catholic Church. They are spies for the church. And their mission is to infiltrate all communities, provinces, and states and, con and cause division wherever they can. They're to become whatever they have to become as a front in order to do this and to even to be elected as civil leaders if possible. But here you have a Jesuit taught candidate running for the Democratic nomination for the President of the United States. How blind can the American people be? And by the way, the current Pope, <coughs> the current Pope, Pope Francis, is the first and only Jesuit Pope the Catholic Church has ever had. He's the only Pope that has come out of this military order of the Catholic Church that they ever, they've ever had. That should tell us something, folks. That should tell us something. Lincoln Chafee used to be a Republican. Then he was an independent. Now he's a Democrat. This guy plays the field for his own self-convenience. He was raised in an Episcopalian, though he <clears throat> tends not to discuss religion or his personal faith. 
However, like the rest, he believes in abortion, says it's the federal government responsibility to protect the rights of poor women. It may be okay by the federal government, but folks, it's an abomination in the eyes of God. It's no different than burning your child to a pagan idol by God's standards. There's Jim Webb, Democrat. He's also pro-choice. He's a non-denominational Christian. He was against same-sex marriage, but now that he's running for the presidential nomination, he has changed his mind and is now for self-convenience. Do these people have the qualifications to build up the wall and stand in the gap? They flip-flop back and forth. They change to whatever suits the situation and for their own advancement. <clears throat> But, hey, they're all religious. <laughs> they claim to be religious, but in fact they have no morals about them whatsoever. They use religion like everything else, only as a front. But why do they claim to be religious at all? I'll tell you why. According to one poll, the... Pew poll, P E W or whatever that is, it says the majority of Americans, and just barely a majority at, the, at, at that, I think it's 53% I've written down here, would be less likely to vote for a presidential candidate who doesn't believe in God. So they profess to believe in God because they know if they don't, certain people wouldn't vote for him at all. And this is higher, not surprisingly, among the Republicans of which 70% say they would be less likely to vote for an atheist in comparison to 42% of the Democrats. So it's obvious why most of them claim to be Christians and believe in God. They know if they don't profess to be Christians, there's a lot of people's, people whose vote they, are, they will never get. So again, it's a front for many of these candidates. Now, We've been talking about Democrats up to now, thus far. But what about the Republicans? We can count on them, can't we? They'll change all this immorality, change it back to the way it used to be, and make things right. Yes, sir, we can count on them. Can we? I'd rather see one of them than what we've got, but Ted Cruz... Republican, committed Southern Baptist. He says he's against same-sex marriage, <clears throat> but recently introduced legislation to protect each state's right to make its decision on the issue. Say what? He's against it, but he thinks the state should be the ones to decide it rather than the federal government? What kind of double talk is that? <clears throat> Speaking of his personal faith, he says, at the end of the day, Faith is not organized religion. It is not going to church. It's not going to church. It's only your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Hebrews 10.25 tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. For that's how we exhort one another and encourage one another in our faith. But he says, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. <clears throat> He kicked off his campaign with the cry, God is not done with America yet. He's right about that, but I'm afraid it's not going to be the way that he thinks. <laughs> Rand Paul, Republican, he was baptized into the Episcop Episcopal Church, but now attends a Presbyterian church where his wife is a deacon. <clears throat> says he did not arrive at his beliefs through childlike faith, but through a fiery furnace of doubt. He describes himself as 100% pro-life. But, 100% pro-life, but on gay marriage, like Ted Cruz, he advocates for the decisions to be made at the state level. Personally, he opposes it, but he said in a recent Fox interview, Fox News interview, that he supports the idea of contracts for gays, couples, and legal rights of marriage, such as a civil union, 
Well, is he for it or is he against it? He says one thing one time and one thing something else. Can he not make up his mind? But that's how politicians are. They want to play both sides of the fence. They want to please everybody. But to be a leader of moral clarity, you can't do that. You have to do what is morally right regardless of what people think. Lindsey Graham, Southern Baptist. While he says he's against same-sex marriage in principle, he has also said it may be time to accept that society is changing. <laughs> I believe marriage has stood the test of time between a man and a woman, he says, ordained by God. And most societies have been or uh, organized around that concept. But, it's t but it is time for us to move forward as a society. More double talk. He's against it, but says we should move forward, forward and allow it to happen. He also says the strength of this nation <clears throat> is that we can worship God on our own terms. No, Mr. Graham, you cannot worship God on your own terms. It doesn't work that way. And because we have done this, trying to worship God on our own terms, that is what, us, has, what has made us weak rather than strong. Jeb Bush, raised in an Episcopal church, but has now turned Catholic because that is the faith of his wife, <clears throat> says he loves the sacraments of the Catholic church and the fact the fact that the church, Catholic Church believes in and acts on absolute truth as its foundational principles. <laughs> ha ha. He says he also carries rosary beads around in his pocket. <clears throat> he, like many of the others, is pro-life only after 20 weeks or five months when the little child is more than half developed in its mother's womb. <clears throat> it's okay to abort children up to that point, but after that, it's not. So is he for abortion or is he not? He's not. He's trying to play both sides of the fence again. He says, we cannot impose, impose a spiritual awakening from Washington, D.C. by passing a law, for it is the crumbling of our moral foundation which is the problem. Well, he's right on that point, but I fear that his moral foundation has crumbled as well. Donald Trump, old Donald, <laughs> he's out in front of everybody today making all these claims. And I wish that he could make them come true. Presbyterian and proud of it, he says. <coughs> he says, I believe in God. I am a Christian. I think the Bible is certainly the book. It is the thing. He says he's so concerned about the Bible that he dare not throw any of them away that people has given him. And our article said he gets a lot of them. I guess people think he needs them. <laughs> he was quoted as saying, there's no way I would ever throw away or do anything negative to the Bible. I would have a fear of doing something other than being very positive. So actually I store them and keep them and sometimes give them away to other people. He says he always goes to church whenever he can especially on Christmas and Easter, and that he is a Sunday church person. That's what he said. His views on gay marriage are changing, but he remains in favor of traditional marriage. But he says, I think I'm evolving <coughs> because I'm a very fair person, but I am for traditional marriage. So he seems to be a little wishy-washy on that as well, but says he is totally against abortion. <clears throat> See how much time I've got left here. May not have time to go through all this. Chris Christie, he's a Catholic, running on the Republican ticket. 
although he doesn't go along with some of the Catholic teachings. <clears throat> in an interview on CBS, he said, my religion says it's a sin. The Catholics say that it's sin, abortion is a sin, and they do say that. But for me, he said, I have always believed that people are born with a predisposition to be homosexual. I was just born that way. That's what he's, you know, he's, his people says. He says, I don't look upon someone who is homosexual as a sinner. He's a Catholic, but he doesn't see that. He supports the unions for, <coughs> for same-sex couples, <coughs> but is not in favor of gay marriage. Double talk again, double talk. <coughs> he doesn't agree with the Supreme Court's decision on same-sex marriage, but says we should comply with the law. Talk about a muddled up mind. This guy has a muddled up mind. And evidently, he's never read the Bible. However, he's pro-life, he says. Carly Forerina, Fur Forerina, ever have her name, last name is pronounced there. She opposes, opposes abortion, but says same-sex couples should be allowed civil unions and the same benefits as those who are married but believes that marriage is between a man and a woman. Again, you know, she's trying to work both sides of the fence, trying to please everyone. <clears throat> Rick Santorum, he's a Catholic, says he opposes same-sex marriage <clears throat> and said it would be a violation of his faith to attend a same-sex wedding. <clears throat> he's outspoken against abortion and said it should be illegal. Even though he's a Catholic, at least he has some morals about him, it would seem, if in fact he's sincere about what he says. Scott Walker, he's raised a Baptist, but now attends a non-denominational evangelical church. He too is only pro-life after five months and says the state should have the right to decide whether same-sex marriage should be legal which doesn't solve a thing, folks. If some states are for it and some are not, then the homosexuals will just go to another state to get married. It's not going to solve anything. John Kasich, Roman Catholic, doesn't believe in same-sex marriage, but says he will abide by the law. Ben Carson, Seventh-day Adventist, out of all the candidates running, hoping to be nominated by their, their party to run for the office of president of the United States, only one of them keeps the true Sabbath. And although the Seventh-day Adventists, they keep the Sabbath, but they don't see any need to keep the rest of the holy days. They don't keep the rest of the holy days. At his official campaign launch, launch in his hometown of Detroit on May 4th, which featured a full gospel choir, it says, <laughs> he told the crowd, I'm probably never going to be politically correct because I'm not a politician. I don't want to be a politician because politicians do what is politically expedient, and I want to do what is right. Speaking of his pro-life stance and belief in traditional marriage, in an open for the Washington Times, he wrote, and he's speaking against Hillary Clinton here, by the way. He said, attempting to characterize love and compassion for human life as being a war on women is deceitful and pathetic. We, the people, must stop allowing ourselves to be manipulated by those with agendas that do not include regard for the sanctity of life. You know, Hillary Clinton says if you're against abor abortion, then it's a war on women. <laughs> Mr. Carson also says, the most important thing for me is to have a relationship with God. To know that the owner, the creator of the universe, loves you, sent his son to die for your sins, that's very empowering. And it is very empowering. 
the article that I was reading said, although he appeals to the Christian vote in some respects, he isn't guaranteed support from the Southern Baptist. <clears throat> Seems he was invited to speak at the Southern Baptist Pastors Conference in June this year, and now he has had to withdraw <laughs> from the event because the president of that conference faced criticism for appearing to endorse a candidate, particularly one who was not a Southern Baptist. So he had to resign from that. They said, we can't endorse him if he keeps Saturday for the Sabbath. That's what they're saying. And besides, they have one of their own running for the nomination, Mr. Mike Huckabee, an ordained Southern Baptist minister. He is concerned about the place of Christianity in contemporary America and has been highly critical critical of opposing, or opposition, I'm sorry, to religious liberty. What he speaks, <coughs> speaking of here is that there is a movement going out there to completely do away with religious liberty in this country. And he's right about that. He said, and it won't stop until, they won't stop until there are no more churches, until there are no more people who are spreading the gospel. And I'm talking now about the unabridged, unapologetic gospel that really is the truth of God. He says there's a group of people out there uh, that would like to see religion completely done away with in this, in this country. And he's right. This movement is the reason religion can no longer be taught in our schools. The, this movement is the reason the Ten, Ten Commandments are no longer displayed on public property. This movement is the reason you can no longer pray in public. And if possible, they would eradicate any form of religion completely out of existence. They are Satan's henchmen. Mr. Huckabee is staunchly against or opposed to abortion, even in the cases of rape and incest, and has called for a complete reveal, repeal of Roe versus Wade. He is also a committed defender of traditional marriage and has signed a pledge in opposition <coughs> to the current case in the Supreme Court. In his 2015 book, God, Guns, Grits, and Gravy, he writes, For true believers, changing the definition of marriage is no more an option than it would be for an observant Jew to serve bacon-wrapped shrimp <laughs> or for a Hindu to open a steakhouse. He's correct in that. He is also opposed to civil unions for same-sex couples. So out of all these people seeking the nomination to run for the office of president, only two seem to have any sense of direction. And neither of these two will ever be nominated. But why? People are already saying they are too, quote, too religious to be the president. They're too religious. The American people do not want a president who they think might actually take his guidance and leadership from this book here. They don't want him. They don't want a president who might somehow get laws passed against their lewdness, against their obscene, indecent, vile, and low-down, vulgar lives. They don't want a president that might do that. The American people don't want a good, decent man to lead them. <clears throat> and if you don't believe me, Look what we've got now. Some have asked, what about the founding fathers? They weren't true Christians. That's right, they weren't. Most of them had some kind of Protestant background. <clears throat> and some were even deists. Deist. Didn't believe in God at all. So how could God use those people to start this nation to bring about the blessings of Abraham? How could he use these, those people and not use the civil leaders today to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. <laughs> Those people probably never kept the true Sabbath or the holy days. So how could he use them and not those today? Because, folks, there was a difference in those people and our civil leaders today. They probably didn't understand the Bible as well as, well as us sitting in this room. But they, they had something our civil leaders don't have today. 
and that is moral clarity. They may not have understood the written laws in this book, but they understood that there was a right and a wrong. <clears throat> they understood that there was good and there was evil. They understood and embraced the sanctity of life and what a true marriage is. And none of the, our civil leaders today really do that. They sought for the good in life and fought against the evil. Our leaders today don't understand right from wrong. They don't know the difference between good and evil. As a matter of fact, some today even seek out the evil and embrace the evil and oppose what is good. Look at what we've got. But there are no more founding fathers people, no more George Washingtons, Abraham Lincolns, Franklin Roosevelt's and Winston Churchill who fought World War II and knew what true evil was. I personally can't imagine any of our civil leaders up until 1973 when Roe versus Wade went into effect about abortion, making abortion legal, when the Supreme Court passed that law, making it legal for a woman to murder her child, and that's exactly what it is. I can't imagine any who would have sanctioned something that evil up until that time. But ever since, every four years, we have an election to choose who we want for president. That's been 41 years ago. It'll be, by the next election, it'll be 42 years. And every four years, the so-called pro-choice and the pro-lifers, pro-life candidates, they debate about this issue every four years. But nobody does anything about it. Nobody, either side. Statistics have estimated that since 1974, when this law went into effect, 41 years ago, and that doesn't include all the abortions before it went into effect, after it became law, 41, 41 years, there has been, brace yourself, there has been 57,496,000 abortions or murders, should I say, of little human beings in this nation. How many great doctors, geniuses, great teachers, great inventors of wonderful machines and gadgets to make our lives easier, and maybe even a few good leaders in 41 years have we destroyed? How does God contain himself? It's estimated that four out of every 10 pregnancies in this nation end in abortions. That's getting close to half people. My God, what kind of people have we become? So no matter who gets the seat, you know, nobody does anything to repeal this evil. And now we have another evil to, to debate about by the politicians, same-sex marriage. And it'll be the same way, same way, debate but no action. And the holes in the walls, folks, are getting bigger every year that goes by. And there's nobody to stand in the gaps and build up the walls. There's nobody with any moral clarity anymore. So my brethren, we should pray like we've never prayed before that the Father will send his Son back to this earth and put an end to all these atrocities. It's no wonder that God is angry. He's angry with his people, and due punishment must be executed. Therefore, we in the church need to diligently do what Christ admonishes us to do in Luke 21, starting in verse 34. He says, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts become overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that the day come upon you unaware. For as a snare it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may become worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. <laughs>